Hello and welcome to the Supernatural Fandom Track on Continual. I'm Gail Z. Martin and our guest today is Keith the Candido and we're going to be talking about the non-canon canon, the tie-in books in the anime that are official but never show up in the actual live show canon. Welcome Keith. Good to be here Gail. Well, tell us, uh, you know, I just gave your name. Tell us a little bit about your background here. You've, you've written three of the Supernatural tie-in books, but take it from here and tell us who you are because you, you've really got an interesting background to be here. Uh, okay, if you say so. Um, <laughs> I have been writing professionally, uh, writing fiction professionally since 1994. Um, a lot of what I've done has been in the world of media tie-ins. So things, you know, novel, novels and short stories, and comic books that are based on things in other media. Uh, most of the vast majority of the tie-in stuff I've done has been in the world of Star Trek. Uh, I've also done Farscape. I've done Supernatural, obviously. Um, world of Warcraft, Sleepy Hollow, Orphan Black, um, Gene Roddenberry's Andromeda, uh, Marvel Comics, uh, Alien, bunches of others, Zorro, um, The X Files, <laughs> and on and on and on. Uh, I've been, my, actually my first short story was a Spider-Man short story back in 1994, and my first novel was a Spider-Man novel back in 1998. Um, and I have continued to, to do a lot of tie-in work as well as my own original work as well. Um, but I've worked in somewhere between 30 and 40 different licensed universes uh, over the course of the last two and a half decades, um, including obviously Supernatural. I wrote the, the I actually, I, the, Supernatural is one of the licenses for which I got to write the first tie-in. Um, there's a few of those. Uh, I did the first Sleepy Hollow book, I did the first Andromeda book, I did the first Farscape book, I did the first... It's a completely irrelevant distinction. <laughs> but... And you did, tell us the three books that you've done with Supernatural, because they're three of my favorites. Oh, thank you. Um, I did Nevermore, which uh, involves the boys going to New York City, specifically to the Bronx, which is where I'm from. They say right what you know. Um, and involves two, two, two separate cases that they're dealing with both of at the same time. One involves a bunch of killings that are Edgar Allan Poe themed, hence the title Nevermore, uh, and also dealing with a haunting. And um, the second one is called Bone Key. It was actually the third Supernatural novel, uh, but my second one called Bone Key, uh, which takes place in Key West, Florida, which is a perfect place to have a Supernatural story. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's full of ghost lore. It is full of clubs playing classic rock covers. And it is full of scantily clad women. It's basically Dean Heaven. And, um, but hard to fake from Vancouver. Well, yes. Um, and, and I'll get into that uh, in a minute. The third book, uh, which was the fourth book overall, uh, was called Heart of the Dragon, which was a three-part story that uh, took place in San Francisco in three different time periods. Uh, the first third of the novel takes place in 1969 and involves the Campbell family, um, Samuel, Deanna, and little Mary Campbell who would later grow up to give birth to Sam and Dean, um, fighting a monster that they banished for 20 years. It comes back in 1989, and John Winchester has to deal with it. And then it comes back again in 2009, and Sam, Dean, and Castiel have to deal with it. And that last third involving the brothers, uh, and Castiel also uh, is right in the middle of the angel-demon war of the fifth season of the show. Okay. Yeah, I love all of those because I think you really do a great job of capturing the feel of the show and the feel of the characters. Um, over, over time, I've read a lot of tie-ins in a lot of different universes, and some of them do that, where you feel like you're really getting an extra episode and it feels very organic to the universe. And others, it might be a well-written story, but there is this sense in the back of your mind that they could have done a search and replace with other names and it would have stood on its own it, it isn't that intrinsically tied in. And you managed to really make it feel like one of the episodes, which I, I tremendously enjoy. Thank you. Um, it, it, that's a, character voices are a really important part of that. Um, and it's something that's important to me in my, my 
original fiction too, is that everybody has a distinct voice. So everybody should sound like what they sound like. And so I'm very careful, particularly when I'm writing dialogue, to make sure that what the person is saying sounds like how they would say it. Um, one example I love to give, I wrote a Star Trek novella back in 2008, I think. Um, it, was a, it was a Next Generation Deep Space Nine crossover story, actually, um, and involved Picard and Cisco working together. Um, because in tie-in fiction, we are not beholden to actor availability or actor contracts, so we can actually do team-ups like that that aren't really feasible in, in the live action version. And there was a line of dialogue which I had originally given to Picard and realized, no, Cisco has to be the one to say this thing that is being said. And by switching, I didn't just say, change it from Picard said to Cisco said, I completely rearranged how this sentence was phrased because Avery Brooks has a different speaking style than Patrick Stewart. Um, and you have to be conscious of that when you're, when you're writing tie-in fiction in particular. The other thing I tried to do with Supernatural in particular, one, one thing I like to do if possible is to try to bring something to the novels that the TV show is not capable of delivering for one reason or other. Something, sometimes it's just something as simple as pairing up a couple of characters who could not be paired up because you could never get the two actors together again or, or you know, or the, or the actors passed away. You know, I can still keep writing Star Trek stories with DeForest Kelly or Leonard Nimoy, you know, with Spock or McCoy or, or, um, or Scotty, even though the actors who played them have, have died. Um, and uh, so that's one of them. But another, with Supernatural in particular, and you, you, you touched on this, in Supernatural, they drive all over the country, but everywhere they go looks just like Vancouver. <laughs> and, it, it's a remarkably Canadian. Yeah. Um, in a novel, we are not constrained by that. So a, a tie-in novel can embrace the location to a degree that the show can, which is why I very specifically chose three locales that have a very distinctive character. Um, the Bronx, Key West, and, and San Francisco are all places that, that where, where you are is very important. And each, each of those cities has a very... Dis a, a distinctiveness about it um so that's uh that that was part of what i was going for there i know jeff marriott <laughs> wrote the same thing he, he wrote the second one uh which was called um uh i forgot what it was called but he wrote this uh witches canyon which mm -hmm. takes in the southwest which is where jeff is from and he did the same thing he tried to you know basically immerse the boys in in the southwest to a degree that you really can't do in vancouver as the X-Files proved every time they tried to go to Arizona. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there, there are cowboys in Canada, but it's not quite the same. Calgary is, is not Canyon Diablo, <laughs> much as we love both. Yeah, yeah that's, that's one of the things that I really enjoy with books is when the setting can come alive for me and the setting actually becomes a character in the book so that the the book couldn't happen the same way anywhere else. Right. And I think that's also something you and I both do in, in our original fiction is, is try to make that setting really important because there's so many series that I've read where I may have never been someplace, but I have read enough books set in that place that I feel like I've got a connection to it. And I think that's one of the fun things with reading. Um, and TV shows can do that. TV shows can do that. Supernatural can't because of the nature of the show is that they travel all over the place, so they're always in a different place every week. There are some shows that, like Bosch, for example, is very much Los Angeles. The Wire is very much Baltimore. Treme is very much New Orleans. All the Law and Order shows are very, very much New York. Um, and that, that and, and for that matter, the, the Dick Wolf Chicago shows, same thing. They, they very much absorb the atmosphere around them of where they're filming. But Supernatural, by, by the nature of its premise, can't really do that unless they had a much bigger budget and can actually travel. Um, yeah, and that just gets into all kinds of complexities. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about how the tie-in process works? Because I think that's always something fans and readers sort of wonder about. Because you often have the books slotted to come out, maybe in between seasons. We wonder what you know that we don't. Um, but there are also things that show up in the books that of course never show up in the show. How does that secret knowledge thing work? Do you guys have a handshake or something? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, with all tie-in works, it starts with the publisher, not with the writer. 
Um, I, I didn't decide, hey, I'm going to write a supernatural novel and then try to get it published. It doesn't work that way um, because uh, I don't control the rights to it. Um, with, with licensed fiction like this, it's work for hire, which means that the books are owned by whoever owns the property. In this case, it's uh, Warner Brothers. But um, in so what happens is whoever owns the property, usually the studio that produces the TV show, if you're talking about a TV tie-in. So for Supernatural, it would be the Warner Brothers. For Marvel or Star Wars, it would be Disney. For Star Trek, it would be CBS and so on. Um, and sometimes it's like the small studio that runs it. Like uh, I did a Leverage novel, for example, and I did that through the, the, the deal was with Electric Entertainment, which is Dean Devlin's production company. They're the ones who control those rights. Uh, sometimes it's the network that shows it. Um, or, 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 well, sometimes the network and the studio are the same. Like uh, Sleepy Hollow was produced by 20th Century Fox and also aired on Fox, so it was all in-house. Um, you know, with Alien, uh, it's, 20, it's also 20th Century Fox because they control the movies. Uh, although, the, now that's Disney too. But, um, <laughs> at the time I wrote my short story in my book, it was still 20th Century Fox up until about the last minute. So, yeah. But um, anyway... So they control the rights and then they will sell the rights to do tie-in fiction to a book publisher. Um, so for example, with the Supernatural novels, um, the first three books were done with HarperCollins. And then the light, and then Harper, Harper declined to do a third book after Bone Key came out. Um, it's, it's, it's weird actually, because the first two books, they, they contracted with two books, Nevermore did really, really well, so well that they actually wanted to add a third book. So I wrote Bone Key. Uh, and then after Bone Key, they decided not to do anymore. But, uh, for whatever reason. But, and then Titan picked it up. And Titan has done all the rest of them, uh, aside from those first three. And, um, but the, the publisher will buy the rights from the studio to do tie-in books. And then the publisher then turns around and hires writers like me and my various and sundry tie-in writer colleagues. Um, and every stage of the process has to be approved by the owner of the property. So, and, and it start. you don't even write the book first. You have to write a plot outline. That has to be approved. Then you write the novel and then that has to be approved. All the stages of the cover art have to be approved. Even for some, the book design has to be approved. Um, that cover copy has to be approved. All of it has to run through. And that, that's, that's the editor's job to deal with all that stuff. And I have, I have also been at that side of the desk. I, I started out working, uh, my, my first job in book publishing, uh, starting in 93, was uh, working for the late Byron Price, who was a book packager. And we did a lot of licensed properties with him, including a whole series of novels based on Marvel Comics. And um, so I've been, I've been on that end of the desk as well. Um, and so all of it has to be approved, uh, including sometimes, you know, who, who you pick to write it. Um, in the case of Supernatural, um, I was approached, the editor who was in charge of it uh, was a guy named John Morgan, with whom I worked when he worked at uh, Berkeley and I worked at Byron Price. He knew I, I liked the show, so I was one of the people he approached to pitch uh, ideas to him. And I actually pitched both Nevermore and Bone Key. He liked both of them. Uh, he decided to go for Nevermore um, and also went with Jeff for Witches Canyon. And then, like I said, when the sales were so good on Nevermore, I said, we need another one. He says, well, why not Bone Key? You like that one, too? It's like, okay. And... We were off to the races. Um, what's interesting is who does the approval, which varies while that, that, what I outlined is the basics of the process. The details vary from license to license. There are some licensors that are incredibly hands-on. There are some that are completely hands-off and there's every variation in between those two extremes. Um, with super, a lot of times it's somebody in the licensing department, you know, uh, because it's a licensed property. So the, the person who approves licensed materials also has to approve the tie-in fiction. Um, for Nevermore, uh, it was that. For Bone Key, there was an interesting, usually it's not the people who produce the show because they're too busy producing the show. Um, producing a weekly TV show, particularly a network show where you're doing, you know, between 20 and 30 episodes a year is a 36 hour a day, nine day a week job. Um, and so they don't have time to approve, you know, uh, tie-in books, especially like an entire novel. That's, 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 that's work. And that's work they don't have, but it's a time consuming job and they don't have the time for it. As it happens, I turned in Bone Key during the writer's strike in 2007. 
Eric Kripke, who was the showrunner at the time, literally had nothing better to do because he was on strike. So, um, so he decided, ah, what the hell? Let me let me take a look at this thing. And after Bone Key, which he approved, um, he liked it. Uh, after that, his office, he still didn't have time to do it himself once the strike was over. But um, his assistant, whose name I no longer recall, unfortunately, because it's been ten or more than 10 years, um, she did the approval. It was his office that did the approvals after that. Once he stopped being showrunner, I'm not sure how it worked. I, I haven't done, I, I only, I didn't really do any more tie-in work. Uh, Titan was trying to go for a variety of different voices, so I didn't do any more after that. But, um, but that was an unusual case. Having said that, there are some cases where, and it's becoming more common now, where at least somebody involved in the running of the show will be involved in, in the tie-ins. As an example, the Star Trek Discovery and Star Trek Picard tie-ins, uh, Kirsten Beyer, who is um, executive story editor on Discovery and uh, supervising producer and also the co-creator of Picard, has been very much involved in supervising and um, uh, dealing with the tie-ins for those two TV shows, both in comic book and novel form. Um, and Kirsten also has a background as a tie-in writer. She's she's written a, a, you know more than a dozen Star Trek novels as well, so she's she's got the the right background for that, which helps. Um, I did a novella based on Heroes Reborn, which was the miniseries that that uh, was a sequel to here to the early two thousand show Heroes, and it was the showrunner of that show who worked with all six of us who did novellas to tie into it very closely. They were very it was very important to them to have the tie-ins tie really really be aggressively tied into the show itself. Uh, my particular job was to, to bridge the gap between the last season of Heroes and the beginning of, uh, of the new show through the eyes of Claire, who was a character who was not in the miniseries because Hayden Panettiere wasn't available. Um, so they wanted something that focused on her, since again, actor availability doesn't matter when you're writing a tie-in novel. Um, so I got to do that. And that, that was a case where I worked very closely. There are others where there was almost no guidance at all just you know do something that takes place between two episodes and you're fine um i did an andromeda novel that was like that um i did a leverage novel where lever leverage is it was was not a very heavily serialized show so it's very easy to plug in as you know just have a have a a heist that takes place there the john rogers who was the co-creator and co-showrunner was very upfront about the fact that these were not all the adventures they had anyway so he had no problem with additional stories that took place between between episodes so but that was you know so so it varies you know how hands-on they will get some of them you know nitpick the crap out of everything and as another example which i haven't worked in unfortunately is uh, star wars which is very very carefully managed what i have worked in which is world of warcraft which is micromanaged um it varies but and that but that's that's part of the challenge of doing it sometimes sometimes it's fun to actually work with the creators on it and and, and do stuff that they want to see so when you were working with the supernatural one, I mean, I'm I'm really thrilled that you actually ended up working with Kripke. I think that's what fans who read tie-in secretly believe is that you guys go off for this secret retreat huddle with the showrunner who, you know, tells you these things that are coming up. That almost you're you're privy to this arcane knowledge. <laughs> Sadly, no. Way, but we want to believe. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I wish it did. Every once in a while, you'll get something like that. Like, like the heroes thing, for example. They were very <laughs> cooperative, and they were like sending us scripts as they came in, and they were sending us script revisions as they came in. But that was the exception. Usually, you find out what you can't do when you do it, and they say no. Um, I was going to. You ever do something where um, you you write something happening, and they come back and go, "No, we nixed that in episode eight. Oh, sure. Happens all the time, particularly when you're dealing with an ongoing series. Um, perfect example, my Sleepy Hollow novel, which was based on the, the Fox show with uh, Tom Neeson and, and um, uh, Nicole Beharry. I, I sent them a proposal for what I wanted to do. Uh, it involved, it, it was actually inspired by something that happened in real life during the Revolutionary War. Uh, during the war, there were a bunch of elegant swords that were given out to heroes of the revolution. They were awarded in 1775, but not actually issued until 1785 because it took that long for the swords to be actually forged. And uh, so my idea was to use those swords, but also that the, the etchings and stuff on the sword were actually magical runes that could cast a spell because 
that's what Sleepy Hollow did. It mixed the American Revolution with magic. So I thought, this, this is perfect. So I, I, I wrote that up. I pitched it to them. They said, great. We love the idea. It can't be a magic sword. Turns out in the second season, which they were in the process of developing, but which hadn't come out yet, there's a magic sword. They didn't want to repeat that. Um, which made sense. So I changed it to something else. The same, the same basic idea, I just made up an award instead of using the existing uh, elegant swords, which worked out better anyway, because it gave me a little more freedom. But, um, but yeah, that, that's the sort of thing that will happen. You know, um, It's worse when it happens after the book has already been published. Um, if, if you talk to the Star Trek editors in, in the 1990s, they were regularly cursing the names of the Deep Space Nine producers um, and for that matter, the, the editors of the Buffy the Vampire Slayer uh, novels, because the status quo kept constantly changing on the show and they wouldn't warn them ahead of time. Um, so, you know, yeah, all sorts of things that would just happen. It's like, wait, but now we have to accommodate for that crap. Um, and of course, because the lead time, the production lead time on a book is much longer, it's not always, so you wind up with books that are, that are already out of date by the time they come out because the change happened without them being able to know about it. So coming back to kind of having the show in your head as you're working on the books, and you were working in the early seasons <clears throat> with Supernatural, so there wasn't 15 years of canon to draw, and you only had a couple of years. Yeah. How, and, and from our vantage point now, we're looking back on them as they were almost baby Winchesters, uh, <laughs> especially when you see that cover on Nevermore. Oh my yeah, gosh, they're done. Um, but if you can dig that out of the memory vault, how, how did you hold them in your head? How did you see them to write about them um, when you didn't have that, that bulk of canon to draw from? I still had some, you know, um, the, I, I based it on what we got, you know. Um, it, it was easier with Supernatural in some sense because there's really only two of them. So, uh, and they're in practically every scene of every episode. Um, you know, they're basically in every scene except the teaser because the teaser is where somebody dies. But <laughs> the, the old joke about the X-Files, don't be in the teaser. Same thing with Supernatural, don't be in the teaser. You're in the teaser, you're gonna die. But, um, but they're in, yeah, they're in every scene of every episode, practically, and uh, they, they dominate the action throughout all this. So even though I only had like a season and a half to go on when I wrote Nevermore, um, and two and a half seasons to go on when I wrote Bone Key, that, that was enough to, to at least get an idea of who these guys were. Um, not always perfectly, and you know, stuff will happen later that, that contradicts it, although I think, I think I did okay with it. There were some readers who didn't think I, it was, it's hysterical because I'll read reviews of all three of my books and there'll be one review who says, well, he wrote Dean perfectly, but his Sam is all wrong. And the very next review says, he wrote Sam perfectly, but his Dean is all wrong. Um, you know, the, and, and part of that is because there was so little at the time to go on. You know, I suspect there would be less of that if I wrote a supernatural novel now, um, but who knows? Uh, well, and what but basically, the only thing you can do is, you know, <laughs> immerse yourself in the material. I always, you know, when I, when I start a project like this, I will sit and I will watch everything. Um, because you got it, even if it's something I'm already familiar with. Um, because I need to, because you look at different things when you're watching it as a writer and you're paying attention to like little, you know, bits of character revelation and how they respond to things and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, that, that's the sort of thing you want to look for. So, yeah, I was just, you know, paying attention, even if it's some, a little thing like, and, and part of it was in the early years that they, they, they kept showing this at the beginning of each episode, but it seems to me that, that probably the most formative thing that happened in Dean's life and the thing that has really con almost controlled his life ever since was his father yelling at him, take, take Sam and get out of here. Now, Dean, go! And that, that's like, that's his whole life right there. You know, um, and I tried to use that where possible, particularly in uh, in Bone Key, where he's told he needs to focus on something important in order to accomplish what what happens in the book, and that's what he focuses on is you know his need to protect his his little brother. And oh, in a way, brother. I can't really call him his little brother; he's like a foot taller than him. But <laughs> but his baby. Yeah, that that's like I I told our girls with with their younger brother, he will always be your younger brother, but he won't always be your little brother. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, it's funny. Although there was one time somebody pointed out uh, in one of the drafts of one of the supernatural novels, I referred to Dean as the short one, which isn't really fair because <laughs> he's not short; he's just shorter. <laughs> there's a there's a quote from Jensen about Jared being so much taller, and he says that it, if somebody asked him what would you change about Jared if you couldn't. He said, "Well, I'd make him shorter so that this six foot one hundred and ninety pound Texan isn't always the little guy." <laughs> Yeah, I can understand that. <laughs> well, and I was going to say, in, in the era of Supernatural that you were writing them, in some ways, they, they were closer to that where they started because so many of the things that happened to break them and scar them and break them apart and put them back together again um, hadn't happened yet. So yeah. you, you got kind of more the original Sam and Dean than... I mean, Sam hadn't had only been possessed once or twice by that. <laughs> that point, he's been repossessed more often than a cheap fort. Yeah. Um, so uh, that that's also kind of interesting. Is that era that you got them in? They were um, a little more factory installed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Although the, the, I mean, the issues are already there. I mean, I wrote Bonkey. Bonkey took place in the third season. Um, which was when, yeah, you know, throughout that entire season, Dean was um, on borrowed time because he had made the deal with the Crossroads team. Uh, I actually made that a plot point in Bone Key also because um, th there was a, a a spirit that was basically going to kill a whole bunch of people in order to accomplish something, and they didn't possess Dean because killing him that sacrifice would have no power because he was already dead. As, as one demon puts it, you're already dead, your meat's just wandering around for a year. Um, and that actually is, is what saves everybody in that particular case, because he'd already made the deal with the demon. So the, the ghost in the novel could not sacrifice Dean's life, or it could, but it wouldn't accomplish anything. So, so he's and like, oh. but that, but that, but you've already got that, where you've got, you know, mm -hmm. the, the brothers each doing stupid crap to, theoretically save each other or save the world and getting in more trouble for it. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the neurotic codependency is there from the get-go. It just gets deeper and deeper. Mm -hmm. um, now, one of the other questions that I think readers ask sometimes is, you know, and if you remember the episode where uh, they did the musical of Supernatural, there's that, that brother moment, the BM. Um, <laughs> unfortunate initials but yeah. that is that is a key piece that reference it in French mistake where they said well we could cut the part where they sit in the Impala and talk about their feelings and the fake Bob Singer goes oh yeah you can get the hate mail yeah uh, but one of the things I've noticed over the course of reading all of the tie-in novels um, that happens less in the tie-in novels than it happens in the best of the fan fiction is that emotional piece where there's a lot more of that brotherly moment talking about feeling stuff is that a um is that a feature instead of a bug in terms of like does does that factor in with your instructions from the powers that be hey keep the focus on the action not the feelings is that just um, really I, the, the guidance isn't that specific usually like i said the, the only guidance we usually get is when we do something they don't want us to do, they tell us not to do it. Um, I think part of it is that, um, you know, it's a novel, we need to tell a story in which the brothers do something in this novel. It's not part of an ongoing narrative in the same sense that the TV show is, it's kind of filling a gap. So for that reason, you don't want to get necessarily too heavy into certain things, especially if it's something that's developing on the show and that's always changing on the show because you're always, you know, playing a game of catch up to some extent. Yeah, you can't um, resolve anything because it's Exactly, sure yeah. Um, I, so it's, it's harder, you know, you can't do big moments in the tie-in fiction because those, the, that's the show's job is to do those. So that may be part of it. I don't, I don't think it's a conscious choice. And also, you know, for, for the fanfic, the fanfic can do whatever the hell they want, which is, which is what's cool about it. Um, and, uh, Everything that we do in the tie-in fiction has to be approved by Warner Brothers. 
uh, fanfic is under no such constraints. Uh, fanfic also isn't under other any other constraints like format or need for a plot or um, this sometimes, yeah, or 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 oversight or anything like that. Again, this is not this doesn't make one good and one bad. It's just the differences between the two. Um, I, I, I've written fanfic. I haven't written any recently because I just don't have time. But um, I don't even have time to read anymore, much less write anything that I'm not getting paid for. But uh, but no, fanfic is fun, and and you can do stuff that you know you couldn't necessarily get away with in tie-in fiction or on the screen for that matter. Um, so that you know, but it's, it's not, I don't think it's a concerted effort. I think it's just a case of you don't you want. We're trying to tell. Mm -hmm. standalone adventures of these guys so because of that and and also because you don't know where the relationship is going to be when the book comes out uh, which is always a, a factor yeah it's a uh, moving target with that too. yeah exactly i mean like what i it, supernatural is, it has the same issue that any ongoing series particularly one that at least has some serialization uh you know like i said uh deep space nine hit this problem buffy hit this problem you, you don't know what they're going to do next you know, yeah, I've often for, for discovery for discovery and Picard. They very specifically are only doing prequel stories mm -hmm. for for the tie-in fictions for both shows. You know, the the one and only Picard tie-in we've gotten so far was was the prequel to the TV show. All the discovery novels have been you know what these characters were doing before the show started or before they showed up on the show at the very least. So that's that's one way to avoid it. <laughs> you know? um, but that, well, and, I think and, that's and, the situation with the Star Wars of. Uh, tie-ins where they had this huge massive um, tie-in universe and then mm. when they came back and decided to do movies again they said yeah no that that's all non-canon now uh, it's yeah. official but it's non-canon we're I, not gonna let it get in the way of the movies eh. well yeah <laughs> that's how that well yeah it's, it's the economics of scale um you're you're not gonna pay millions of dollars to J.J. Abrams and Brian Johnson to make movies for you and tell them, oh, by the way, you have to be beholden in, in this movie that you're going to make that billions and billions of people are going to pay money to see. You have to be beholden to 30 years worth of tie-in novels that 1% of your viewership have read. Yeah. Uh, and that's the thing. Any tie-in novel is going to reach less than 10% of the audience of the thing it ties into, if you're talking screen, screen tie-ins. Um, it's not a statistically relevant portion of the audience, which is one of the reasons why you don't see the references. Um, because they're not, you know, again, uh, they're not gonna be beholden to something that most of their audience is unfamiliar with. And they don't want the people who are unfamiliar with it to be confused either. Um, you will still see them taking, like Star Wars has taken things from the tie-in fiction and <laughs> used it. Um, my favorite example is the use of Admiral Thrawn who was a character Tim Zahn created for the post-Return of the Jedi fiction he did, because at the time there were no plans to do anything post-Return of the Jedi. Then Disney bought it up and they did, and they, but the character of Thorne was very popular and also a really good character, so they incorporated him into the Star Wars mm -hmm. Rebels uh, and made very good use of him. Uh, that will happen occasionally. Um, not always. <laughs> uh, but it's a cool thing when it does. I don't stress about it because I don't, really understand why people make a fuss about what's real in a fictional construct. <laughs> um, yeah, I just had somebody take me to task on a Wendigo and told me that it couldn't do something. And I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, well, okay, let's ignore the fact that there are Wendigo type creatures in a variety of cultures, none of which yeah. consulted with each other for canon consistency. <laughs> So a fictional construct. <laughs> yeah. and, and I, I have very little patience with the dismissal of, and part that's part of it is because it's always it's almost done in terms of dismissiveness. Um, yes, the tie-in novels are not canon. You know what else isn't canon? The entire Marvel Cinematic Universe is not canon. And you know what? People still go see those movies a little. Um, the the when you translate something to another medium, it isn't necessarily going to be consistent. The, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is and the DC Extended Universe, for that matter, all the various Berlantiverse TV shows, none of them are canonical. They are not consistent completely with the comic books on which they are based. The canon is the monthly comics that Marvel and DC put out. Um, well, let's be honest. And, 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 and consistent. Yeah. I'm sorry? 
the comic books aren't necessarily consistent either with all the records. No, but that's not what we're talking about. We're, yeah, uh, the, 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 um, you know, it, it, we've had four different versions of Sherlock Holmes on screen over the last 15 years, uh, which are not consistent with each other and none of which are consistent with Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, so what? <laughs> you know, uh, there's, as long as the stories work in the universe, um, that's what matters. Yeah. You know, people, people accept the fact that Robert Downey Jr.'s Tony Stark bears precisely no resemblance to the Tony Stark of the comic books that has been around since 1962 because Iron Man was a phenomenal movie and Downey Jr. did a really good job of, of creating this version of Tony Stark. So we accept it. Um, on the other hand, you know, uh, what's a good example? Uh, well, <laughs> it wasn't so much Henry Cavill's fault, but, um, you know, Henry Cavill, or Brandon Routh actually does, does, a version of Superman, which isn't as well received, and that's pretty much been forgotten at this point. Um, it's you know the 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 trivia footnote Superman. <laughs> Between well, bringing it back on the on the universe side with Supernatural, of course, there's the biggie, which is that the tie-in writer is God. Carver Edlin turns out to be Chuck. Yes. Turns out to be God. First of all, I would like to say for the record that it freaked me the hell out when that character first showed up. Um, because I've never seen a guy who wrote tie-in novels be a character on a TV show to which it was tying into. Um, and I was half expecting to see my novels up as his uh, things there, but they didn't, they didn't go for that. They went for him actually writing novel versions of their adventures. Um, but, uh, but it was still, and yes, and then he wound up being God. And I, I try not to let that go to my head. <laughs> well, and I think it's, it's been interesting as we see in seasons 14 and 15, this playing out where God becomes the villain and God is running through all these alternate scripts in his head. He has all of these worlds with his different Sams and Deans and you're my favorites. And <laughs> they are all playing out alternate scripts for what he thought. There's one where everybody's a squirrel apparently. And <laughs> and now he is destroying those worlds and, and coming after Sam and Dean. So you not only have God as tie-in writer, but God, but vengeful tie-in writer. Crisis on Infinite Supernaturals, yes. The, um, well, yeah, and, and, and parallel universe theory is always a good way to work around this, you know. Star Trek did that. Uh, Stargate's done that. Lots of other people have done that. So there's lots. Of, there's lots of ways to make that work. Well, at least um, Jensen didn't have to get a, a goatee and a mustache to be yes, yes, evil so Jensen. Yes. Yeah, he must have the evil, evil D. Um, although I yeah. make more sense for Sam too. He's he's more Spock-like of the two of them. Yeah, this is true. Well, you know, they did play out. Chuck decided to run them through all the scenarios where he right. tried to kill them, and so we got to watch them kill each other over and over right again. Over what the hell was going on like you do but like, uh yeah but the yeah it's it's I, I one of the things i like about the show is that it's it's aware of its fandom and and aware of its tropes and aware of uh, you know and 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 will occasionally play with them just to mess with people's heads um you know the fact they actually had an episode called jump the shark um but, well they uh, had called fan fiction that definitely yes. proved somebody in yeah. the back room was reading it oh yes um, and, and the fan bases and all the rest of it. So that, that, and that, 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 that's been, I think, part of the fun of the show is that it's embraced that. It's a very self-aware, self-referential show. Yeah. And then we get the meta episodes and the fourth wall. I mean, it really has done some fun things with that, not taking itself too seriously. Yeah, yeah. So... I guess, uh, any other thoughts as, as we're kind of coming down to the end of our time together, any other thoughts of this, this whole vengeful tie-in writer God thing? I, I will, we'll see how it plays out. I mean, I think it's, it's after, after this many years, you got to do something big to go out on, I guess. Um, and it doesn't and they get kind bigger. Of through everybody else. Yes. And destroying multiple universes is a pretty good way uh, to, to, to go big as it were. Um, I, it's one of the one of the problems that you face is trying to find a way to top yourself each year, which mm -hmm. which gets harder and harder and more and more of a challenge. And and the show didn't always manage it as well as it could have. You know, trying. Leviathan. To... Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The the 
that was actually the example I was thinking of too. <laughs> um, and and you know, it's it's hard when you've already you know, threatened to just to you've already you've already done the apocalypse and you did it you know ten years ago. <laughs> we are now into apocalypti. I mean, what's yeah. The yeah, one of my favorite lines from Buffy, it's like, until I met you, I didn't know there was a plural of apocalypse. And, um, but, the, you know, the, the, they had to do something. And I'm, I'm certainly all for bringing uh, Chuck back. So. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Of course, yeah. you know, talk about added suspense. We have, at this point, seven episodes left. They haven't filmed the last two. And then, you know, the great pause yeah. happened. And uh, the hiatus got longer than we expected. So at yeah. this point, we don't we don't know how it's going to end yet. But uh, I, mean, not know. <laughs> I know it's going to be a great ride. Um, Keith, tell us a little bit about what you've got going on now, where we can find you. I know you're doing some wonderful uh, author readings here on Continual. Where else can we find you? Uh, if you go my, my website, such as it is, is decandido.net. It's basically a link dump for all the other places you can find me. Um, there's, uh, I, I have a blog that I maintain. Uh, I'm on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram uh, regularly. Um, I'm doing, as, as you mentioned, I'm doing a series of readings that I've been doing since the pandemic started um, called CRAD COVID Readings. There have been, I've read uh, about 20, more than 20 of my uh, works of short fiction with more coming. Um, and that's, that's been a fun thing to do to just, you know. I've got a Patreon. Uh, where I do TV and movie reviews um, and uh, excerpts from my work in progress and vignettes featuring my original characters. Um, and you have a series, an original series out with False Step. Yes. Um, I've got, uh, well, um, also, before I forget, I also write uh, nonfiction for Tor.com. Uh, I've been doing, uh, lately, what I've been doing is a rewatch of Star Trek Voyager. Uh, I've already rewatched the original series, Next Generation and Deep Space Nine. Uh, I also did a rewatch of... Um, Batman 66 and the Stargate franchise. And I did the great superhero movie rewatch where I rewatched every single live action movie based on a superhero comic book. Um, for, as far as fiction goes, uh, I've got uh, a bunch of novels coming out. I've, I've done the Precinct series, which is a fantasy police procedural. Uh, there are five novels in the series in a short story collection so far. Uh, the sixth novel, Phoenix Precinct, is in process and we're hoping to have that out either end of this year, beginning of next year, depending. Uh, I've got an urban fantasy series uh, set here in the Bronx called uh, the, the Adventures of Brom Gold. I'm working on book two of that. Uh, the first book is called The Furnace Sealed and is available now. Uh, and uh, I'm also hoping to get book two out. That'll probably come out before Phoenix Precinct. And then um, I've got um, two collaborative novels coming out this year. Uh, one will be out soon. Uh, it's called To Helen Regroup, which is a uh, collaboration with David Sherman. David is a, David's an ex-Marine. Uh, the 18th Race is a trilogy of military science fiction novels. Uh, he wrote the first two a bunch of years ago. And uh, due to various health problems, he was having trouble finishing the third book. So he asked, I edited the first two books uh, when they came out. David asked me to work with him to finish the third book. So that's done. That'll be out soon. Uh, I've also written a thriller, a uh, serial killer novel uh, called Animal. Uh, in collaboration with Dr. Munish K. Batra, which will be published by Wordfire Press around the end of the year. And um, I think that's everything. <laughs> it's a movie. Everything is a movie. Oh, and I got some short stories coming out. I've got a, a, a short story, uh, two anthologies from Crazy Eight Press that are coming out this year, Badass Moms and Pangea 3 Redemption. Uh, the latter is a shared world uh, edited by Michael Jan Friedman. The first is about badass moms. I think you're in that one too, right? I'm not in that one, but I know you and I are in a couple of anthologies. Okay, yeah, I lose track. Um, you too. And, uh, and I'm also, my wife and I are putting together an anthology, which will be going up on Kickstarter soon. Um, I'm in that and, one. Yes. Uh, and and that, that's, we're, we're starting up a small press called Whispering Wood. And uh, we're hoping to have our first project up on Kickstarter sometime no later than June. So... Very busy. Hey, thank you so much, Keith, for joining us. It's been a lot of fun. Likewise. And uh, if you haven't already read Keith's Supernatural books, as well as his other books, please uh, go looking for them. They are definitely worth it. And uh, he's a great writer, and especially those, those uh, Supernatural tie-ins. Love them to pieces. Thank you for joining us on the Supernatural Phantom Track here at Continual. 
I'm Gail, I'm your host, Gail Z. Martin. Uh, stay tuned for more supernatural love, uh, lore, and legacy here on Continual. Thank you so much, Keith. Thanks.